All right. Well, hey, guys, it's Greg Myroth. Um, I'm back here with another episode of Pottery Conversations. And uh, I've got a very special guest today. I'm super, super excited about this. Uh, about a year ago, when folks started asking me about, you know, doing this, I was like, man, I'm not sure I want to do any of these interviews and podcasts. But honestly, the very first person I thought when I thought, who would I want to talk to? Who would who would first of all, who would do this with me? And who would did I know I could have great conversations with easy conversations? Um, and that person was Mark Latta. I'm super excited to have him with, with us here today. Um, when I first started, I met Mark back in, it was 1997 when I first started buying art pottery. Mark, you probably don't remember this, but it was at an auction up in Princeton, I think. Um, and I think I had a catalog from some auction house. You came up over my shoulder and I met, we never met before. You st said, what is that? What are you looking at? And, you know, obviously you knew a lot more than I did. And um, just every every time I would see you though, if I had a question, you were one of the folks that was always willing to share information. You know, in this business, some people are more willing to share than others, but I have always from day one found Mark to be the person who wanted to help educate me as a young collector and then as a young dealer. And there's so many things when I look back on my career that Mark helped me kind of like, okay, you know, is this something I want to get into? Um, and one of those things that I, I definitely think we're going to talk about at some point today is about just stepping up your sights and your collecting, right? Like at first, you know, you're spending, a, you get to spend a hundred dollars on a piece of pottery and that's kind of a little bit of a stretch. And then you just keep raising your sights. And Mark helped me through that process. And, and there'd be times where I'd be like maybe looking at a piece and he's like, yeah, you know, there's, there's money left in that, or that's a good buy. And, and just help me throughout all that time. So I really was super excited when Mark agreed to do this with me. Um, so with that, um, a lot of you old collectors probably know Mark. A lot of the new folks don't, but I promise he's going to share a lot of wisdom with us today. And uh, looking forward to looking forward to this session. And thanks for joining us, Mark. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, yeah. So I guess first of all, I was going to ask you, like, just why don't you share with everybody how how you and, and Marie started collecting? Because I know you've assembled an absolutely amazing collection, but how, what got, what got you guys started collecting art pottery? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, you know, thanks a lot for asking me to be a part of this because, you know, it's a, this is uh education and uh, sharing is the most important part of collecting as far as uh, we're concerned. Um, what got us started was uh, uh, she and I met in eight in 1984. We both liked old stuff. We're riding around on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. She want Maria wants to stop at these craft shops and antique shops, which there were bazillions of them, with a bench out in front of every one of them for the men to sit in while the women went in and shopped the crafts and and uh, and antiques. Uh, Marie says to me after doing this for about six months, she says, "You know, why don't you pick out something to collect and let's look for it together?" Big mistake. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The first thing we were getting Country Living Magazine at the time, and there was an article in there that had uh, uh, Majelica pottery pasted all over this B&B &B back in 1984. Uh, I thought, well, that stuff looks kind of cool. So we go out, we buy a piece of Majelica pottery. At that time, uh, there are in Muscatine, we lived in Wilton, Iowa, in Muscatine, Iowa, there are like six or eight good antique shops in Muscatine. And uh, Marie found time to go and hit, do a round in those shops at least once a week. Uh, pretty soon, she's bringing home pieces of Majelica. Um, birthday presents, Christmas presents, or just look what I found. Um, we get a book. We start looking into it. Uh, it's it's pretty cool stuff. We go to an we're going to auctions. Uh, there's a local junk auction in our town every uh, every Saturday afternoon. We're at this Saturday afternoon auction. There's a piece of Roseville pottery comes up. A, a, like I think it was like a brown clematis bowl with a chip in it. She says, buy that piece of Roseville pottery for me. I've always wanted a piece of Roseville. I've never heard the word before or anything, but I buy it. $17.50. Probably couldn't get that out of it today. And this is the 1984 <laughs> price. Buy that. We get it home. I'm looking at this stuff. I'm thinking, well, this is stuff's pretty cool. Not too long after that, we go out and we buy the two. We buy uh, the Huxford One book that's written by uh, Sharon and Bob Huxford 
and I look in there and there's all kinds of cool stuff in here. Uh, they've got a page of each, uh, uh, of each, uh, line of Roseville pottery that that they produced. Uh, I decide we decide that we're going to go and collect one of each, and we start down that path. Uh, and uh, at that time, there's no internet, there's no yeah. there's no real place to buy much Roseville pottery in Iowa, but so uh, you know, it was got kind of limited until nineteen uh, until nineteen late nineteen eighties. There was some auctions that were advertised that were um over in kansas uh they were scott brown auctions oh, yeah. We, went, yeah we went to a couple of scotty brown auctions that were you know i don't know if you'd been to any of those great i think i did now that you mentioned it, i think that's where i met dave johnson so i think i met i saw you because i would see you at princeton i think i probably would see you once in a while at the third sunday market like in yeah. bloomington did you ever go there i think yeah yeah we we hit, yeah. We had to hit them all you know i mean yeah but Before Dave you know, was, I remember meeting you and Dave out at um, Greensburg, Kansas at a Brown auction way out there. Year, I forgot about that. That was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. You, you know, when you mentioned the internet, like when then I was thought you were going to say, do you remember a company I think was Smith and Jones? They they started kind of that first, not quite online. I don't know if you say it was online, but it was a cat. It was, it was like a, I don't think they did an in-person thing. I just think they had a catalog and maybe they're doing something online because that was like that was early on as far as the beginning of those online options I think. and Jones did that and I don't know that might have been late or early 90s late 80s whenever they did that and I watched that I did not buy anything out of there I got I actually got a computer early on but you know we were dial-up back then yeah you know? yeah, yeah I remember trying to snipe uh snipe stuff early on in eBay <laughs> and it's on a dial-up and and you had to dial up you know 10 minutes early and sit there with a clicker and hope yeah. that it hit you know yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and I missed a lot of stuff probably some t well one of the things I've learned over the years in buying is sometimes when you lose you win yeah <laughs> Yeah. At auction, yeah. I've been the back bidder, the bridesmaid on lots of stuff, and uh, you know, uh, in retrospect, uh, it's probably a good thing that I that somebody beat me to it. Uh, it you know, and it's funny because um, same, de definitely think the same thing. But then also, it's interesting to me because like a lot of times these pieces come back around. Like that's one thing when I started become, you know, I started selling in 1997. And there are pots that I have sold two and three times now. And I never really thought about that when I got into this, but there's some really sweet pots. I think, oh man, I wish I hung on to that. And it comes and I sell it. And a few years later, it comes back around to me and I keep it for a while. And I, so, you know, it's really, it's really an interesting thing. I was just sort of uh, just holding on to these pots for the next, next generation of collectors and, and cycling around. But yeah, it's really cool how I've, I've had that happen a few times where I've got the same piece back. And one of the things, you know, in in that line that and we've got I've seen things I bid on two or three times and ended up end up find ending up in our collection. And I've I've made up my mind that if I don't, you know, if I if I miss it, you know, there's always first of all, there's always another pot. Yeah. And if and everything I got in my collection, I have in my collection is is meant to be you know and if i don't have it you know it's it's just not meant to be there yet i i'm a i'm a real fatalist that way yeah. uh you know the first great pot that marie and i bought uh it came up it came up for auction and we just it was a great piece of rookwood we absolutely loved it and uh it was just that was way out of our range we were not prepared to buy it financially or emotionally or anything um you know the, the the collector dies. It comes on the market two years later. Great pieces of pottery that come up too fast. Uh, there's they lose the you know they lose some of their cachet. Yeah. And lots of times the second second time around they come up for a lot less money. And that's our first great piece of rookwood. Kate, we bought that way. You know what? So, that's another little collecting collecting nugget that you taught me a long time ago because I remember now that you say that I remember like going to one of the Rookwood auctions and like asking and I'd watch you and I'm thinking and first of all I want to get into like kind of your advice for new collectors at some point because one of the things I've always thought about you is you know um, you're very diverse in what you collect I'll see you you spend a boatload of money on something and then I'll see you buy a hundred dollar something else right so so you're very very diverse in, in what you collect so i've always thought 
that was very, very interesting. But one of the things I remember you talking about was that exact thing where I'd watch a vase. And I'm like, why did that thing just sell for 1500 and a year and a half ago, it sold for $5,000. And it's, it is that, like you're saying, sometimes it just, it's just, the, I guess it's just the luck of the day maybe, but then it's also that stuff is coming back on the market so quickly sometimes. And that's probably hurry. Yeah. And, and one of those things that one of the, like one of our, the mine and Marie's collections are uh, Rookwood bookends and figurines. And there's a, there's a huge, amount of those out there and they they made a lot of them. they made a lot of them we yeah. watched those sell for years picked off a couple of them because i was told early on by another collector that you need to be buying these animals so yeah. we'd buy a few whenever they were whenever i felt the price was right and it just and the mood struck me but yeah. uh nick and marilyn nicholson come out with a book uh yeah. that on just figurines and bookends and uh they they were avidly collecting. Jim Fleming was avidly collecting. Jim Blue or Greg Bloom was. I mean the Thomases. There were people. There was a group of small group of people that were avidly collecting, and they were running each other up on these things. I, I remember those. I remember the the um, Rookwood auctions, Cincinnati Art Gallery auctions, and those little <laughs> those little bitty ducks, and they're selling for six hundred bucks. And you're thinking, and it's sort of what you. It was so weird as a young, like a new person getting into this, because you look at one and be 200 bucks and the next one comes up and it's 900 and it's just a little different shape and it's just a little less common. And it's just so like having those books and understanding the rarity of some of those things makes it yeah. makes it. And a, a lot deal. of times, Greg, it wasn't even the shape. It was the great glaze color, you know, yeah. where you found something in what Rick would call their Coromandel glaze, as opposed to just a plain white matte gla matte white glaze. And I mean, you would be you'd be looking a hundred to a thousand dollars. You know, one would be a hundred, yeah. the next would be a thousand bucks simply over the glaze, uh, yeah. the glaze treatment uh, of the object. Uh, yeah. Anything and, and, about the bookends and and uh, and and figurines that you know those some of those collectors got everything they wanted and were done. So, and some of the other and some of them died. And here comes the collections back on the market again. And yeah. the ones that come up that are new to the market, you know, the the old collectors have got the few collectors that are out there yet have got them. So here's our chance. So now we're filling in the blanks with uh, with uh, that. And then there's if you look through the Rookwood uh, second book of uh, Rookwood Pottery by Pex, they made a lot of figurines and bookends. And, and Nick and Marilyn's book, uh, there's a, there's a lot of them out there. And you know our our collection is in. We're ninety percent full. <laughs> <laughs> but that last 10% is killing me. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. So um, one of the things I definitely wanted to ask you about is I feel like, you know, like I said, you were very helpful to me when I was starting out. So I guess, you know, looking at where we're at in 2024, the pottery market, the state of, you know, the internet and auctions declining and the shows are fewer and fewer. Because I, I feel like, you know, that's, you know, when I started out, that's kind of how I learned was going to the shows and, but like, so at this point, I mean, what would, what would be your words of wisdom or your advice for a new collector just starting out when you're looking at all the different options of what to buy and the pitfalls of buying online and not, you know, not like, if you think about trying to start out now, like it's a lot harder to go out and find a whole bunch of pots someplace to get that, to get that education. So what would be your, what would be some of the advice you might have for new collectors? You know, well, buy it. First of all, buying online is fine, you know, uh, but the problem is, and you have your just start pottery website and and you talked about going to shows and i you know those two things that going to shows and talk finding reputable dealers and and looking at your website you've paid your dues you know and and you do your best you know you miss a few but we oh, all yeah. do i do yeah. but you do your best to try to accurately describe it and i think a lot most dealers that are left in the pottery world today that have that they do their best to try to educate uh the buyers and 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 not sell them a piece of junk and yeah. you know i would say to to new collectors to to consider you know looking that doing that route i have but i have books sitting here you know i have yeah. uh, uh that's how we did it used to do it old school before you would go on pottery collectors group and just ask a question and never never put in the effort to do research yourself there's a yeah. lot of books that there's still a lot of books out there that can be had for nothing that have tremendous information in them about yeah. 
what what what's available out there. Some through those books, I found that you know I I kind of found stuff that I liked more than others, and so you know uh, a new collector has to buy figure out what they like and not let somebody else tell them what they like, but but go and 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 see what, just really what strikes them pulls at their heartstrings and and you know those are the things to look at and it's not always the the thousand dollar pot or even the hundred dollar pot it's just you know you might be you might be attracted to uh mccoy little figurines that they made the ladder figures that the mccoy you know which of course i've got a collection of uh yeah Yeah. because they tug at my heart you know there's just so many things out there that that are that are just cool that a lot of pottery makers made uh you and i had a conversation yesterday when the storms were rolling through iowa that uh that you know uh one of the things that uh i'm buying looking at today is monmouth uh gardenware from the 1930s and and some of the animals they made yeah yeah and francoma and and you know what- yeah and i was mentioning that francoma collection i'd ha- i bought a couple of years ago and how much fun that was and then yesterday you know i've dabbled on a little pigeon forge here and there yesterday i bought an amazing collection of pigeon forge some incredible pieces and it's stuff stuff i'd never even seen before and i thought this is so cool and it's funny because like you know, you know, I've been in the Rookwood, Roseville, Van Briggle, Weller, all the, you know, all the, the groovies and newcombs and all that stuff, which is always fun. But even, you know, after doing this for almost 30 years, it's really cool to find another collecting interest. And that's one thing I, you know, I, I found, I've always found interesting about you because you guys are, like I said, I mean, I'll, I'll be seeing you pick up a $50 piece of, of McCoy or whatever it is. And then next you're looking at a $5,000 piece of Rookwood. And I think that's what's important for people. Um, I think that's important to be able to just say, look, what is it that I like, right? Rather than just because something has a Rookwood stamp on it, this is what I should buy. If you see something else you like, like go for it and learn yeah. more about it, right? And the books are books are a tremendous resource to us. And I um, you know, I was looking at the Frank Norman Weller books, right, recently, right? His books are his books are incredible. Uh, it's really cool what he's what you know the research he's done and telling the story of the different lines and stuff and that helps I think spark the interest in in the different pottery makers. Yeah, you know, and, and you mentioned that you know so so well first of all the pigeon forge of course I have a pigeon forge collection. Yeah, and they made all these cool little animals and some you know they well you know I'm a Rookwood collector and pigeon forge made uh, three or four great crow figurines you know yeah. uh, of which. Uh, I had to, you know, I, I've got a great Rookwood crow figurine that I paid sixty five hundred dollars for. I've oh, got wow. a great, I've got a great uh, uh, Pigeon Forge crow figurine that I paid five hundred dollars for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, that's just as cool as the Rookwood one, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to be had if you know if like if if it would be a crow that would be your fancy. It does. You don't have to have a sixty five hundred dollar Rookwood crow. You know, you can you can have one that the, you can have that option of uh, of finding something just as cool and not maybe not having to pay that price. Uh, yeah. You know, and not have to compete against somebody like Mark Latta to try to buy them. You know, yeah. I tried that that particular crow. I bought it privately from the person that outbid me the I think the second time on that crow, and then finally they they called uh, through uh, through a text message. I I after selling that person some red winged uh, figurines. Uh, I sent a text message. Oh, you still interested in that crow? I need to get. I'm done collecting, you know, it's like some people fall in and out of it. And, yeah. uh, and I, you know, I plug away. Yeah. I yeah. Frank Norman's book, you know, but I first, I, that there were a couple of Weller books, the Huxford Weller book and, and Gilbert McDonald's Weller books are just full of all kinds of information and pictures. A lot of the information isn't true, true, but a lot of it is. I mean, yeah. n- you know, 90% of it is, but there's some misinformation out there. Frank's yeah. going out and tried to clarify and and rectify some of the misinformation that's there. And it's done a pretty damn good job of it, along yeah. with a like, great picture book. <laughs> you, you know what? Yeah, and I, I tell you, and I actually, I'm, I'm going to be doing an interview with Frank coming up here soon. I was talking to him the other day about his book. and But one of the things, like, the book, I love the book because it's the most, it's, it's actually a, a resource book that I actually enjoy reading. And I love how he tells a story of how he acquired some of those pieces, which is kind of interesting because I've had a few people say, Greg, 
you ought to write a book about all your collecting excursions you go on. So, you know, I'll, I'll be talking to somebody and tell the story. Oh, I was over at this house and look, I did this and that. And the bad thing for me is I never kept, I don't, you know, it'd be completely from memory because I didn't keep track of anything. But Frank has just an incredible storyline of when he bought this piece and how and the, the, the lengths he would go to to acquire a particular piece. It's like, you know, there's a true love for, for acquiring that pottery. That's one thing I was going to mention. The other thing I think is really cool, because I'm curious, one of the questions I want to ask you next is that, you know, I, I knew, and folks listening, we're probably going to be all over the board with this conversation because this that's is how Mark, Greg, Mark that's and I you are. and me, Greg. Yeah, and like, because with his, his Mark's wife, Marie, and my wife, Lana, they're all there. Whenever we're together, they're laughing about Mark and I because we're, we're off on all these tangents and, and uh, not always staying on topic. But um, one of the things I want to talk about, I, I want I wrote my note here is I want to talk about what some things that you think are undervalued. And I'm going to kind of throw one of my things out first. And just because what I've seen is, I'm just kind of amazed that I think Weller isn't is amazingly undervalued when you look at the the hand decorated work that Weller was doing and some of the Hudsons and the Oceans are like I mean Sicard is still really really strong but some of the Hudsons and the Oceans seem like I, I think in relation to other hand painted make the Rookwoods and some of the other things just way undervalued and when I was kind of thinking why I think some of it is the documentation because when you start looking at like the glaze lines and it's just not and and why is you know this hudson marked and that one's not and, and the, just the difference is there i feel like that causes some confusion for collectors so i'm curious so anyway that's just that's one i want to throw out there what are some of the makers that you know you think are maybe undervalued in today's market or do you look at this and just say you know what the quality of this art this piece of art pottery in relation to this maker um is way undervalued because one other one I'll throw out for so I'll turn it over to you is Owens. When 20 years ago I was like, man, Owens like the Owens lightweight, some of the Owens glazes. I mean, some of the best made art pottery from the early 1900s. And it's you know I was buying a lot for a while, and about 10 years later I just started selling it because it was going nowhere, and it just it's never really got a collector's base. So I'm just curious. Anyway, what what else? What do you think are some of the undervalued makers that you would you? Would well, recommend? you know, you talk about Weller, and you know I have uh, I. We have a fairly substantial Weller collection. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention is, is uh, that we've, you know, some of our Weller collections already gone to the Zanesville Museum of Art and is out on, in, with an agreement with them, it's not just stuck in on some shelves, it's out on display uh, on the lower level of the Zanesville Museum of Art and will stay out on display. You know, one of the, you talk about uh, undervalued, you know, if you look at what Weller produced, they, 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 Quality control wasn't the same as it was with with Roseville and certainly as much as it was with Rookwood. Right. But that being said, they had some great artists working there that did some great work on pots. And you people get all tore up about what's on the bottom of the vase, that yeah. Rookwood flame mark versus the Weller ink dye stamp on it as opposed to what's on the side of the vase. And not yeah. just what's on the side of the vase lots of times, there's some incredible work that got done at Weller. And that's that stuff. If it was on a, if there was a Rookwood logo on the bottom of it, you'd add a zero to the back end to, to yeah. the price, you know? Instead of a $1,000 pot, it's a $10,000 pot. And the artwork's just as good. You know, that's another collecting nugget that you just added that Tony Olson mentioned when he talked about like, don't, you know, we, we did one of these on UND and he said about, you know, just because you look at it and you see a UND logo on it, if it looks like a turd, I think this not, might be, this might not have gotten our podcast, our video, but his basic comment, if it looks like a turd, trust your judgment. It's probably a turd, right? Just because it's got a Rookwood logo and, and or on it or a UND logo. And like you said, look at the side of the vase. What does the artwork look like? And does this pot speak to you? And do you like the quality of the vase? And, and that's the truth. And so there's there's one right there. Weller Hudson's being one of them. They produce Weller produced a lot of Luelsis. Most of it's so dark that you can't see. But there are some gems in there. Yeah. You know, they they had uh, you know uh, they had some great decorators er, early on that were involved in it. Uh, there was you know say uh, there were there was uh, you know Blake and Hall uh, painted dogs. You know uh, May Timberlake was at Weller early on, and she was fabulous uh there was uh they had some early people i have a couple of pieces that were done by gordon mull that you know yeah. was before 1900 and they the artwork on those 
overall is usually pretty strong. Uh, they had a guy that went on to Rookwood. His name was Dabowski. His flowers are yeah. always on. If you, you find rarely find one of from Weller or one from uh, Rookwood, but they're always great. You know, yeah. uh, I have a, I have an example of each, and uh, uh, and I treasure them. And they're just they're just brown glazed pieces with flowers painted on them. But the artwork is fabulous. You know, yeah. and uh, and uh, you and you learn by looking. Uh, your eye can tell you what's good and what's yeah. not. You know. Yeah. Uh, and, and shy away from the stuff that if it if just because it has that logo on the bottom of it uh even when you buy a piece of roseville production where that you know some of it has great molding color some mm -hmm. of it doesn't uh if it's blue it sells it seems to it seems to be a lot more attractive than something was that was brown you know yeah, uh, yeah. and you learn yeah. those things yeah so what are what anything else? Because like I said, you know, anything else you think is like, hey, if I'm a new collector, and I'm interested in something other than the Rookwoods, Rosevilles, Wellers, Van Briggles, and the typical things, yeah. what what else would you might suggest somebody you know, take a look at? You just at? bought that Pigeon Forge. I know it's going to come online here pretty soon. That Pigeon Forge collection, you know, I I have a I have a group of maybe thirty or forty minis in all different glaze colors and stuff and they were they're all artists signed on the bottom no yeah. pigeon forge is one of them you know I, all those minis i have 15 and 20 dollars in you know and they're and yeah. they're great and every once in a while you, i scavenge up one with a great glaze on it you know but still 15 or 20 dollars it's and a those, great way to start collecting right because you can get into the lower price point collecting. it's not going to break the bank and it's a good starting point and, you know um because that's interesting i was going to i was going to mention so there was a gosh it's been two or three years ago but I was buying a big collection of Roosevelt in San Diego. And she says, it's about four or 500 pieces. And we were flying out to, to get it. And she says, she calls me up the next day. And she says, Greg, I have this Francoma collection. I'll, I'll sell you the Roosevelt collection, but you have to take the Francoma collection. She wasn't really worried about I was going to pay for it. She's just like, you just have to take the Francoma collection too. So I get out there and I'm, I had literally never bought a, purposely bought a piece of Francoma in my life. And I start looking up all these animals. I'm like, my gosh, there's quite an interest in these, these animals. So I buy this Francoma collection. And honestly, I, well, I had way more fun with the Francoma than I did Roseville because I was learning something new and I was like meeting a bunch of new collectors. So that was a really cool thing to experience. And the other one that I think about um, is Nicodemus. So I bought, bought a couple of Nicodemus collections. I thought, wow, there's a, there, so those little, those smaller kind of niche collections or, or makers, there's, there's, you know, there's becoming more and more interest in, in that, those. And I think that might be a good place for, for the, for younger, more uh, entry level collectors to look at. I think, you know, and, and you, you mentioned Frank Homa, I told you, well, you know, I, you and I had that conversation yesterday while it was storming here, you know, well, I've got that, I've got a Frank Homa collection here, you know, and I, and yeah. The the cool here's a cool Frank Oma collection story. I'm I I have the Susan Cox books, the early Frank Oma books, and Marie and I had them. We bought them, you know, on the secondary market, you know, back in the eighties. I back in the eighties, I go to our junk auction in in Wilton, Iowa, and I'm down there on a Saturday morning. I'm working six seven days a week, but I go down there on a Saturday morning. I look in there. There's advertised three thousand pieces of Frank Oma. I go, I've had the, I've had the Susan Cox books. I go down there and look and amongst the, there's tables full of Frank Homa sitting there. Amongst the tables is a bunch of animals, a but uh, some pots, pots with Frank pottery ink stamp marks on them, a pots with pot and puma marks on the bottom of them. And wow. I, I call, I go, this is before pre-cell phone. I call my wife up, Marie, and I say, Marie, you need to get down here. There is, there is uh, some treasure sitting amongst the tables here and nobody will know. And guess what? She came. She comes out. I had to work that day. We goes down to the auction, and the all well, amongst all the dinnerware, the all the big high powered dealers that were were there were buying big chunks of dinnerware, you know, and uh, and just left the little animals and all that stuff alone. So Mark and Marie Lada have an instant great Franco <laughs> collection. Started a collection right there. Yeah, and, but there, knowledge is power. I had the Susan Cox books, and I never would have known what was good and what wasn't if those books hadn't taught me that, you know, that this stuff is kind of, you know, that they made this stuff and it's, 
It's kind of rare. Uh, yes. We're talking about Frank Como. We, we, you and I are seeing a lot of mid-century type people, yeah. uh, mid-century type pe collectors that are coming into the market. Frank Oma did a lot, you know, they they were designing up into the 60s, 70s and 80s. And they made a lot of great, uh, you know, mid-century shapes that mm -hmm. you can collect for nothing today mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, to decorate your room with. And, uh, and, and some of them are pretty cool and they're just not on the market yet. I mean, they yeah. just, uh, the market hasn't realized what's, what, what, what their true yeah. value might be. Yeah. Like Hager's yeah. starting to pick up Royal Hager's starting to pick up They're They've got it. Some of the, the people have got it now with, uh, with Hager, but there's still some bargains out there and a lot of the material out there to be had, but, but Frank Coma is one of those that hasn't, hasn't hit yet yeah you know hager is another that's a good one too because some of those hager glazes are really cool those some of those glazes i think are and and there's yeah i mean there's becoming more interest in hager but yeah that's one that's probably another one that's probably undervalued so I, another thing i want to ask you about is uh you know when you're evaluating a piece of pottery like you know in general what what how do you how do you can how do you handle condition or how what, what's your thoughts on condition because i it's funny i hear um you know, and I, I've, I've always been, I've always been one to say, you know, I want to know what's going on with the condition of a pot, but, you know, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with buying a damaged or repaired piece of pottery. It's just, you need to know about it because you want to make an educated decision on how much am I investing in this piece of pottery? Cause it's, you know, it's, I feel like people are, a lot of younger people I meet are worried about fakes and reproductions. And I pretty much like, look, 15 minutes of looking at Roseville and you can pretty much identify 90% of the fakes, right? There's a couple of those, the Rosecraft panel nude wall pockets are a little, some of those are a little true. There's a few Roseville fakes that are a little bit better, but 90% of the fakes you're going to know immediately. There's a few Rookwood fake. I mean, I was taken by a Rookwood fake years ago, but like, you know, most people pretty quickly are, are going to be able to tell a lot of fakes. But I think where people are getting taken advantage of is buying what they think is a mint pot or paying a mint price for a piece of pottery and finding out it's repaired. And, you know, I see, I mean, a lot of the reputable auctions will have condition reports. You can ask for a condition report, but there's a lot of folks that there's no condition description at all. And I've, I've had people argue I and mean, I've had some dealers and some auction house and some collectors saying, nobody cared, you know, this what this this is our nobody cares about the condition well i'm just curious what your thoughts are and how you handle condition because i have my own theories and i want to maybe talk about how you so number one do you think it's important condition and then number two like what you know let's talk a little bit about the impacts of that on the value of pots first of all what do you think about how do you hand like obviously i'm sure but you're not going to buy a twenty thousand dollar pot without discerning the condition of it right i mean you're you're worried about condition in all cases Ab well absolutely for yeah, a couple of rules on condition Mar the mark ladder rules once okay even in hairlines and hairlines are hard to determine but yep. a, a cracked pot's always a cracked pot if it's got a chip on it a chip on the base isn't as offensive as a chip on the rim uh, yeah. That being said, I try to not buy in a, a repair. You never know what it's what a repair is covering up, and some repairs are very good and they are hard to determine. Uh, yeah. If I buy a repaired pot, if I buy a pot, I want to know that it's not repaired, and probably I will pass on a repair. There's very few repaired parts in our collection. Now so, there's some cracks and there's some chips and then a lot of drill holes. Yeah, you'd rather have which is an interesting comment. I want to make sure everybody uh, listening uh, hears what you're saying. So what you're saying is you'd rather have that pot. If it's got a thumbnail size chip on the base ring, you'd rather see that chip, know that chip's there rather than have that base repaired. Because I have a lot of people ask me, should I get this repaired? And most of the time I tell them no. I mean, well, I, I tell them if you don't like the way it looks, get it repaired. But if you're cool with it, leave it as is because i think that's exactly right because a lot of times people if i have something that's repaired 
like a lot of people will say, well, you do have a, do you have a picture of it before? I'm thinking I didn't repair it. So no, I don't have a picture of it before, but I can see that, that that's a very good point. That's, but, that's it, it's part, it's well, it's part of the, and we're, we're, our collections are part of the history of, uh, you know, that, that pot, and part of the history of that pot is it, you know, it got banged into, uh, you know, it got dropped on the floor and got a bruise on the rim or whatever, you know, those yeah. things are part of it uh, that I, uh, that in terms of, Drill holes, when we were electrifying America back in the early 1900s, uh, that a couple of the companies tried, to, and including Rookwood, tried to manufacture lamp specifics. They soon found out that what well, they were they were tied to that vase could only be used as a lamp. It could not be used as a vase. They yeah. so, so they started just they dropped making lamps. And just started having vases that you could come in and pick your vase out. And they actually even had a lot of specific shapes. All of them did that you could pick out a, a lamp base shape and get it drilled if you wanted to and turn it into a lamp. So unfortunately, or fortunately, a lot of the best looking stuff got drilled, you know. Yeah. I don't want to repair drill hole. I want to, that that drill hole is part of its part of that, what that pot was. Uh, yeah. And like when they did it at the Rookwood factory, those drill holes are all, all you always know when it's a Rookwood drill hole because they they knew how to do it and do it clean. It's a clean yeah. drill hole on the bottom all the way through, didn't break out. And I, I just don't want, uh, I don't want those repaired. One of those things that that happened back in the, in the 90s, especially, and into the 2000s was that, when Rookwood was, or when Weller, when Roseville was hot, and middle period Roseville was hot, uh, they that when we were they were paying fifteen hundred two thousand dollars for a sunflower vase or a future vase that there was so much of it that it had been damaged and a whole bunch of it got repaired at that yeah. time. You know that stuff still out there. Yeah, you know? but um, you know, yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because, um, well. I tell people, and, and I firmly believe this, more than 50% of the Roseville on the market has been damaged and repaired. More, more than 50% is damaged I, and repaired. I, I, been, I agree. I concur. Yeah, I've been buying Roseville. I've sold probably 50,000 pieces of Roseville since 1997. And, you know, I buy at auctions. I buy at estates. I buy all over the place. And I can tell you about 50% of what's out there is repaired. And and I think when somebody says, well, you know, this is this vase is on eBay for two hundred dollars and mine's three ninety five. I'm like, well, mine's mint. The one on eBay might be, might not be. That's the risk, you know, you can take. And 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 if you want to buy a repaired pot, that, that's fine. Just know what you're buying. So let me ask you this. You know, you've talked about the drill hole. You talked about base chip. And so if. If you so basically what you're saying is that vase is cracked, you're probably not interested. But if I you would, yeah, very few hairlines. Yeah. I bought a lot of hairlines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not intentionally. Right. So if you've got the same whatever, I don't care if it's Rook of Rose or whatever it is, but if you got the same vase and it's mint, or maybe it does make a difference on the maker, but you got the same vase, you got the mint example, and you got a, you got the piece with a base chip or a drill hole. What sort of the reduction in value are you assigning for that minor a Cisco will say it's minor damaged piece versus the mint piece? Well, Mark Latta, is, but well, if it's a piece of something that's production, like a production piece of Rookwood or Roseville yep. or whatever, if it's a you know, it would be less than half. For me, it's less than half. I yep. mean, and it would have then it would have to be something that I really would fill fit my collection whatever uh, you know uh, you i recently bought a piece of roselle fuji from you with a base chip on it and yeah. a line in the top of it a very yeah. a very faint line you had it well described i mean it was a very faint line but it was there but it's 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 my collection i didn't buy it for a resale item and everything and i probably bought it at close to half price maybe maybe yeah. a little more but it was a piece of roseville fuji that yeah. you just you know you don't th those are not the things you run out and see all right. the time it, it's not a piece of uh you know green zephyr lily uh, right. So that you that you're going to see six of them in the next month, right? Right. So basically, if it's a production piece, and I, and I think as you go up the scale of rarity and value, that reduction in value for damage yeah. or restoration decreases. If it's a Delarobia, yeah, 
and it's got a small chip on it, it doesn't really matter that much, probably. No. If, you, if it's a blue clematis vase and it's got a chip, you're probably just going to pass because you can find another production vase like that in the future. Unless it's that rare or the Futura, that flying saucer that everybody's chasing these days. If it's that and it's got some damage on it, okay. And it was a year or so ago, I had a tank that was restored. And it was funny because the customer, the client of mine that wanted to buy that tank, <laughs> the first comment was, I'm glad it's repaired because it's going to be less costly than it was if it was meant. So he was of the position was as long as it's a good restoration, he was cool with it. And he's looking at it thinking, I can get it. I can get this rare piece from my collection, fill this spot, and I can fill it at a price that's less than meant. I think like it's, it's almost like different collecting interests, right? Same sort of thing with condition. It's just the important thing is understand what you're buying, right? Buy from somebody that knows what they're talking about or at a minimum is going to guarantee. So sometimes I, I'll have people that are, you know, maybe they don't know me or they're just concerned. I always just tell people, look, this pot is guaranteed for life not to be repaired, right? It's like, I don't, you know, I don't intentionally sell something that's repaired. And once you get it, you can take it to somebody else and say, hey, is there, is there anything wrong with this? But I, I encourage people to make sure you're inspecting your pottery, know what you're buying, and let that play into the valuation, whether or not it's a mint or, or damaged piece. So um, I want to switch gears a little bit here, and I want to talk. So I know you have a very diverse collection. You're in a lot of different things. But I've always thought it was Mark and Marie Latta, they are they are – among the highest of the highest end as far as Rookwood collection collectors go. So let's talk a little bit about Rookwood and kind of one of the things that I really want to do at some point is sort of have some sort of good, better, best of different pottery makers, right? There's different things that play into this, but if we could talk for a little bit about um, some of the Mark Latta tips for evaluating maybe production Rookwood or you know, the scenics or just kind of in general, like how, how do you go about evaluating or what would be some tips you would provide for that you're willing to share for maybe in those, that criteria, what's good, better, and best for, let's just say Rookwood, because I know that's something that you, you are heavily involved in. Yeah. You know, and now, you know, I, I used to, we used to buy other stuff, but now in, in Rookwood, you know, and I've, and, and I would say that our primary focus today is on, and still, you know, making our Rookwood collection, which is big, making it better, you know, not making it necessarily bigger, but certainly making it better and, and finding that one last figurine, you know, that one uh, snail, that Rookwood snail I need. Yeah. Um, but uh, what's, what's good, better, best? Well, first of all, you know, what, what's, What's good out there today that are still probably undervalued is you look at uh, all of the standard glaze stuff, the the brown glaze stuff that Rookwood produced. Uh, you know, there there's a lot of great artwork on that. Uh, the quality was was really good with Rookwood uh, in terms of the actual pot and the glazing. Uh, so a lot of it's uh, the brownware is uncrazed, which I, I look for, and. Uh, and you know, the, and it's bargains today, you know. The, and so yeah. I still, you know, I'm, I, I'll still buy a Rookwood standard glaze floral from time to time. Uh, I'm concentrating on buying, you know, stuff with animals and 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 Native Americans on it right now, which is, uh, you know, that's where our collection is is heading. Um, but but there's one of the things um, I I I have studied and uh, decided about. 15 years, 20 years ago to buy Rookwood matte glaze pieces. And first I was buying just uh, early decorated pieces, painted mats. Uh, you've got a wonderful one on your website right now. Uh, but, you know, I, I was buying painted mats and you start picking up the matte glaze pieces and realize that, you know, they made some great production stuff from starting in about 1900. So yeah. I, I'm looking at what's, What's pretty good right now is for Mark Latta is uh, Rookwood that was produced from 1900 to 1916. Uh, so I'm buy I'm buying that stuff. And why am I buying that? Because 
they changed their rookwood changed their clay consistency to a porcelain, uh, a higher fired stuff, and they used you started using different glazes after 1916 and all of so the glazes lay frothier, heavier, and have much more interest before 1916 on on production rookwood or okay. even any of their decorated stuff. So so Mark. Um... The production pieces, because one of my favorite eras of Rookwood is around, what is it, 13, 14, maybe 15, when I think it was Henschel was doing the majority of those. They're just taking a production shape and he they're they're unsigned, but they're they're caught they're in size design. That was mostly Henschel work, right? So some, some I bought some super bases like that from you. And I typically think they're 13s and 14s, but maybe they're a couple other years, but like mostly around 1913, right? Yeah, that, that was T. Okay, so a lot of those are teens. Uh Henschel, Henschel was involved in a lot of it. But I think yeah. that the, you know, you you say this, and this is just, you know, my conjecture, that I think that there were also people in the glazing. Gla glaciers in the glazing department that got down the Native American designs, the, okay. the arts and crafts looking designs and yeah. in, in there. Uh, the real, truly wonderful ones, I think, were done by William Henschel. I, okay. I agree with that. Uh, and we have some of those here. I have a I have a vase with camels incised around it that is, is actually assigned in one in, in the same sh shape. It's kind of a bowl shape. Uh, or jardinier shape with with birds and that isn't signed but you know it was william henschel's work you know i mean and, and, and they're wonderful and is that from 13 14 15 those, that? 13, those are 12 yeah. 13 14 15 up until yeah. you know he's still using those good glazes uh rookwood came out with what they called their ambroso glaze which yeah maybe which was all different colors. It wasn't just brown. It was green. It was blue. And there's just the, the, a lot of interest on the pot. Then they came out with that in 1910. And I think William Henschel and some of the glaciers got good, you know, got good at realizing how that would flow over those carved designs and just make a really interesting pot, you know? Okay. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you see, I'm getting excited about that. I like yeah. that. You yeah. That's, too. that's one of my favorite, favorite periods too. So Yeah. Uh, so what else, uh, as far as going up the ladder, then from the going better up the, to the ladder? Best. So, so what? Okay, so now we, you know. So now we're at nineteen seventeen, and what Rookwood had always strived for was an uncrased pot, mm -hmm. and the, and and they had some real winners, uh, you know, uh, with un with uncrased stuff. Uh, some of the early vellums in nineteen oh five. 06 were uncrazed and then all of a sudden we get crazing on them so something changed there they had some iris glaze stuff their their shiny glaze with, with white what they call a, a white glaze on them their uh, rookwood uh, iris glaze stuff that was they would come up with some that were uncrazed and and i searched those out those are best okay so let me you're, they, you're telling me something i've not really connected before so you're saying in 05 06 there was a period of time where the I, we saw some uncrazed iris glazes we started no, seeing un crazy so Is okay uncrazed okay so uncrazed so what, what we saw the uncrazed uh, vellum glazes were okay. 05 06 okay. if you look at that and then all of a sudden we come up with crazy if you okay. want to know a little bit more about rookwood that if that in 1907 they decided <laughs> they always use this shading method with airbrushes to shade different colors. And in 1907, and it just seems like it's only mostly in 1907, they put a black, they they shaded it black, dark black on the top, halfway down the vase, and then went to a lighter shade. Those vases pop. The 1907 oh, iris cool. glaze pieces pop, you know, and those are just things you learn as you yeah. and, and and realize that happened as you collect rookwood. And and I and I gravitate towards those and and I don't know if other people realize it, but you watch uh, the prices realized, and those pieces seem to bring pretty good. Those Premium. pieces okay. always seem to bring pretty good money. Um, but okay, here comes 1917. The, the 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 clay formula changes. The glaze formula changes. They've got they've got dedicated mature decorators at Rookwood at that time. They can put they can put a. Uh, a flower or a bird on a pot better, you know, just at the best of the, that they have in their whole lifetime. And now we've got these uncrazed pots that get start get turned out 
on on shapes that are that that are sellable and actually that that work well that that flow well with the designs that they're putting on them after 1917. So we come into the 20s and we've got this great stuff that Rookwood is creating with great decorators and uh, and, and uncrazed and uh, you know it's that that's you know that's one of my focuses today. Uh, I've had help along the way. Uh, many of you out there know Riley Humler. Riley has, uh, and, and I've had a good relationship with Riley. We talk a lot about Rookwood and uh, Riley's got a good uh, 1920s collection and he's ruined some things for himself by uh, convincing Mark Latta that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that yeah, some, <laughs> this is some of the best Rookwood that was ever made. Was added a, some competition uh, for, <laughs> for Riley there, huh? <laughs> poor Riley. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and speaking of Riley, uh, okay, so you know, uh, one of the things I one of the little things I wanted to put in here is I don't know if we were going to go there today, but you yeah, know, Maria, and, Maria and I are involved in a couple museum uh, exhibitions this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one, one is in our local museum here, the Muscatine Art Center, of which I'm on the board of trustees there, and right now we've got 200 ceramic animals on two on on two floors. Along, along with uh, the Muscatine Art Center's uh, two-dimensional paintings and etchings uh, hanging on the walls around it, and it's called Animals in Art. It is that it's fabulous. That's the, the collection is uh, it, the, their art enhances my, uh, you know, Marie and my uh, animal collection, uh, which includes Weller and Rookwood, and you know, some vases and and, and all yeah. kinds of stuff. Uh, Pigeon Forge, Monmouth. Red Wing, it's all there, and uh, you can see how diverse our collection is. Anderson how, is how long is the exhibit going? How, what's what's the it's duration? Only, it, it, it ends, I think, on June sixteenth. Okay. Um, but and the another the other exhibit that we're involved in is uh, Marie and I are involved with uh, uh, the Iowa State Museum. It's called the Bernier Museum in Ames, Iowa, and. Uh, We've got a collection of a hundred pieces of Rookwood sitting there. Uh, Riley Hummer is going to come and give a talk on June second. There, uh, Rego is going to do a, a Zoom talk on it uh, later on in the fall. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it mimics the what the exhibition that got Marie and I all fired up about Rookwood that that happened in 1993 called the Glorious Gamble that we saw. Okay. In the so, and uh, the exhibit that we have at the Bernier is as good as the Glorious Gamble. Uh, nice. With maybe a, a few pieces that aren't quite as good, but 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 a lot of the examples that are, I consider better, you know? Yeah. So uh, it's it's What's, a fun exhibit. Um, and you said that is, did you say that's June? That's a, that's going on all year long. It's going so, on year long, but then Riley, you, what's going on the second? June the second. second June, Riley's going to come up to. He's going to come to our house, stay overnight, and we're going to drive up to Ames on the second of June. And Riley's going to talk about. Uh, he's going to. He's going to give a presentation on the Glorious Gamble. Okay. And the, the Glover Collection. He's going to okay. talk about both of those. Uh, yep. Which is the Glover Collection was, of course, the turning point. I think of collecting Rookwood uh, in the United States. So oh, absolutely. A major yeah, yeah. turning point. That started the fire for sure. So yeah. I, yeah, I will definitely get um, more information in the show notes for this. So that I get posted on the website, you can post it on YouTube. We'll get on different social media to get help get the word out for, for both of those things. So, so that's a that's amazing. It's a great chance for people that want to actually see some of this um, these this amazing amazing pottery in person. It'd be a great opportunity to do that. So highly encourage you to try to make one or both. And I can say about Ames. So back a few years ago, you did the AAPA show there that you guys helped facilitate. Yep, yep. There's a lot of good restaurants in Ames. Ames is a neat town. I, I really enjoyed my time there. I can picture a couple of the restaurants that, you know, I always tell people, I might steer you wrong in lots of things, but food is not one of them. When I go to a town, I find some really good restaurants to eat at. I found some really good places in Ames. I can picture them right now. I cannot think of the names of them, but um, I'm sure you can help guide them. Or if you want any restaurant recommendations while you're in Ames, let me know. I can help with that. Um, and like I said, I'll get I'll get all this posted on the website so people can have more information on here. So um, that will that will help with that. Anything else we haven't talked about, Mark, that you think would be 
interesting for our listeners to hear about? Anything I didn't ask you or things that any, any words of wisdom that you'd have for folks? Well, the words of wisdom is, okay, so, you know, I, you know, you and I have talked for a long time and we yeah. share, you know, we share some information back and forth about, you know, what's good what and what's bad and what sells and what doesn't and, uh, and who's good and bad. And yeah. because there, there are some, there are some people that don't, don't, condition isn't that important to them that yep. are out there selling too and you know yep. that, that is important but i uh, you know one of the things that that i think is important is that's worked really well for me is we have several associations out there and one that uh, that i'm involved in here that we got started in our living room was called the iowa art pottery association uh that we still have meetings you know five or six times a year up in Wilton, Iowa uh, at a community center. And we have a swap table that you would die for, to die for, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> swap table. Uh, we, we have food. Uh, we have, we share uh, mystery pots. We share latest finds. It, it's just a lot of fun. And we started that group and, and others, not everybody lives close to Wilton, Iowa. Uh, you know, they could, but, but some of you people out there could, could, consider getting together with some people and starting a group like that it's 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 a step above being able to share you know stuff online it's just it's yeah. just a lot of oh, yeah. to get together yeah. and we have people coming from a couple hundred miles away regularly to come to that meeting is, is there a website for that at all or anything I I know, we used to but you know what it's just nobody ever it's like everybody else with a website we're too lazy to put stuff on there so we kind of okay. let it go okay. by the website how do how do i let my uh how do i let my my listeners my 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 customers and everybody find out more about the the Iowa Art Pottery Association. You know what? Uh, you just give it. You got my email address. If they yep. were, if they're interested in that, you can put our um, okay. Marie and my email. I won't put your email on there because I get so many. But I will. If you're interested, in learn more. Contact me. I will get you in contact. Absolutely. With Ab you yep. you can do you, something like that. Would be great. Yep. I'm I'm a member of so saying that you know I'm a member of the Wisconsin and the yeah. Minnesota groups. And regularly, I get asked to give uh, programs for the Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota groups. You know, to do a presentation. That's where I've got to uh, dig in and actually think about what you know. Think about what I'm collecting. Think about what others might want to hear about it. You know, yeah. and uh, and and be diverse because they don't want to hear another presentation from Mark Latta on Rookwood Pottery. They've heard it all. You know, already yeah. over the 25 years I've been involved in, with these groups. Uh, they, you know, so so we do talk about these. Uh, you know, I'm I'm coming to talk about. I've got to give one in Wisconsin in October, and it's not going to be on Rookwood Pottery. I don't know what it's going to be on, but it's not. It's going to be about something else. Uh, you know. We're involved in that. I'm involved in the AAPA as well as you are. Uh, yeah. I think that's a very, it's an important organization that that, that struggles to have members that, uh, you know, that are, that are, struggles to have members. And it's, uh, yeah. there's some, there's been some great articles. Um, Maria holds all, we, in our basement here, we have all the past journals and, uh, and I go back and reread them sometimes. And there's the current journals that come out and, uh, just full of all kinds of great information in them. And yeah. uh, so, so to be, you know, I, so I guess here's my tidbit, show up, suit up, you know, go to shows, you know, don't, you know, not everything has to be bought online. You know, uh, you guys do, you and you and Lana do shows, you know, I know you're doing, oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the next one is. Maybe Madison. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, the next one we'll do will be Madison. Madison, yeah. and you know what? I don't know, and, and that's here in the Midwest. I mean, if you if you collect art pottery and don't show up for that, you're you're, you're missing out a great opportunity. Yeah. yeah, that's a great one day show, and I, you know, and and yeah, I don't I don't bring a ton of pottery to sell at those shows. I'm just going there. To I know why customers, you're there. Talk to people like you, um, and I buy a lot of times. People bring me collections. I usually come back with, you know thousands of pots usually from a show like that from different collections and stuff but um i find that it's just you know a step enhancing the relationships meeting new people seeing what other people are buying and selling and just learning from each other it's a great opportunity and that that motivates that motivates you as a collector and it helps educate you as a collector and you know i think that helps you ultimately make better decisions as a collector so yeah, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that. 
I will make sure to get links to as many of these things on, on our show notes as I can and uh, help to get that word out there. Yeah. And you know, and the other tidbit is you say you watch what other people are buying. And I, you know, I, I, I by, by making my collect, what's made my collection good is I bought a lot of mistakes along the way, you know, but I've, but I bought a lot of pots and, and sell some of them uh, and resell some of them. Sometimes I buy some to resell. I only do one show a year. You, yeah. you come and see me at Madison because you know, most of my stuff's fresh. I, you know, I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not a pottery dealer, but I, but I've got a good eye, especially like for Workwood, uh, you know, yeah. so, and I don't need to keep it all. Uh, yeah. but, but, but I always watch what other people are buying too and how much they're paying for it and watching trends. And that just fascinates me. And I'm sure as, as you've made a business it, out of it, you've done yeah. that. Yourself. You know, it does me too. And it's, it's interesting. So you'll start looking at like, um, without getting into any specifics, but you just take a, a matte green pot by a, some Carolina potter or, and you look at Weller and you look at Tico and you look at the, you look at these pots, you're like, well, man, this Weller matte green glaze is as good as any glaze Tico or anybody else was making at that time. And it just doesn't have that same interest. Or you look at this Carolina potter, I'll post this at some, some Carolina collector say, well, that's a ridiculous price for that, Greg, but for this Carolina collector, but when you start getting into a matte green collector that hasn't seen that glaze or like, it's just, it's just expanding your interest beyond like this silo of here's what, Weller should sell for, or here's what Van Briggle should sell for, or here's what's good in Van Briggle, and you start looking at different makers, it helps you just gain a better understanding across the whole board of what was going on at that particular time or that particular glaze style or decorating style or form style. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you know, and you mentioned Van Briggle, and I have a small Van Briggle collection here too, and it's just like, how you how do we learn about Van Briggle? You pick up every Van Briggle pot you yeah. ever see and turn it over and look at the bottom and ask questions and get get whatever's been written about Van Briggle and read through it and you know yeah. pick up a, a ten thousand pots and pretty soon you'll be able to pick up a pot and say oh yeah that was a seven to twelve uh, yeah. that one's uh, you know that one's done in the teens whether it has a mark on the bottom of it or not you know or yeah. that, you know in in you just and you sometimes and then pretty soon you get to the point where you can look at the outside of the pot and look at the glaze and know you know well that's what this yeah. that's what this is. Van Briggle's one of those potteries that you you mentioned pick it up. That's what Van Briggle's a pottery that you have to pick up and touch and feel because of the dead matte glaze. There's just something yeah. about holding Van Briggle in your hand that just like makes it that much more interesting and desirable. I think. So. Yeah, it, it does. And, you know, Artist Van Briggle was the, the reason that uh, that Rookwood got into uh, got into Matt Glazes. And, of course, Weller and, and, and Roseville followed was you know, and all the rest. And Owens, the reason they followed was because of Artist Van Briggle, you know, yeah. uh, and he yeah. was he was at Rookwood a year after he came back from Europe. And uh, then because of tuberculosis, had to move to Colorado Springs and start his own start his own, yeah. Pops, you know. Yeah, very much so. All right, sir. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I super, super appreciate you doing this. I knew from uh, when I first said, okay, I'll, I'll give this a whirl. I thought Mark was one of the top people on my list. I thought I need to reach out to because I, I I think I mentioned this to you a year ago. And so, somebody yeah. just asked me about doing this. And I think I saw you and I thought, I'm thinking, I'm not going to do that. Who am I going to get the team to talk to me? And I think I think I was at we were at a show because I think I saw you like 15 minutes later. And I said, I said, hey, Mark, if I did if I did this, do you remember that? Because I yes. think I went up to you and I said, you looked at me. And you're like, yeah, I do that. And I said, OK, well, maybe I'll do this. And I, it was that's probably been two years ago that I first. Yeah, and you know why that was, you know, and so my wife, Marie, looks at me and she says, what in the hell are you thinking? You know, yeah. it's like, you know, one of the things I've learned, Greg, out here, and it's just a life lesson is the more you give, the more you get. You know, yeah. that, that's why I'm here today. And you and you and Lana have been great friends to us anyhow. I mean, yeah. when I have a friend ask me for, you know, would you do this? And it's kind of as a favor. Of course I will. You know, yeah. You know, that's very cool. Um, that Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's very true. Because when I when I. Um, when I did the first episode with Tony, I, I was shocked how much feedback I got. I, I would just get these little messages like, brilliant, great idea. You know, they wouldn't really say much, but it's just nice because most people aren't going to take the time to actually say much of anything, you know, like, um, or, you know, more often than not, people, there's going to be negative feedback and people just oh, don't yeah. say anything, right? Like, 
but yep. no, it's it's been cool. I enjoy doing it, and I hope hope we can keep getting the word out. And it's they've been well received so far, and you know people people take out it what they want to take out of it, and hopefully it's helpful. But um, I've always enjoyed whenever I see you and Marie, it's always a lot of fun. We're always like like. You know, I'm always running around like a madman. Hey, I'm showing this pot. I'm like, hey, Mark, can you come look at this? And, you know, you're like, oh, Greg, I wouldn't touch that. Or, hey, there's money left in that. Or here's something cool. And or, even- hey, you du- hey, you dumbass, that's repaired. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, too. Yeah, you might want to look at that a little closer because you just missed the hairline. Sure. <laughs> yep. All right, sir. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, I'll get this posted it'll probably be a week or so before we get it well actually you know what i'll try to get this out really quick because we're coming up we'll be coming up on june 2nd here pretty quick so i will get this thing posted just as quickly as we can i'll let you know when it goes up and then uh, we'll just get get um show notes in here i know you sent me the cards on the exhibit i'll get photos of that added into the show notes of this too so people can see this and i most everyone knows how to easily reach me and I can put you in contact with Mark, Marie, and any of the any of the other groups that you might be interested in hearing more about. So thank you, thank you sir. You thank guys you, have a Memorial Day weekend and take care. It was great talking to you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. I got my Memorial Day shirt on. Today. You are you are ready to go. I didn't I didn't think that far ahead. So. <laughs> I'm gonna go kill him. Take care. Yep. Awesome. Take care, buddy. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.